Welcome back to Light the Fuse, Charles Hood. How are you? This entire intro will be in rhyme, and it will not cost me not a dime. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not going to keep up with the rhyming. Yeah, I, don't think, I don't think we can do that, yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm wonderful. Wonderful. How are you? Good, good. Uh, you know, anytime I get to see you, it's a great day, and um, we've got a great, fun interview for people today. I think you should you should intro this one a little bit, if you could. David did the special features for Mission Impossible 3. He directed a bunch of these special features. And MI3, I think, has some of the most extensive features. At least it was the first one to have some real ones, because 1 and 2 yeah. don't really have much beyond like a normal press kit. But three like really starts to dig into some stuff. Yeah, but as we've discovered, it it also frustratingly spread across uh, formats and yeah. Uh, like I wish David had, had been given the chance to just do like one feature length documentary right. about it all. But it is like a feature length or more worth of material if you go through it all. And a lot of it's on the iTunes. It's spread it's spread across different formats. If you have the Blu-ray retailer has, exclusive versions and yeah, right. All this stuff. So you know it as it goes. But actually, which I should plug one of our earlier Patreon episodes from a while ago. We did a special piece from the uh, HD DVD that is no longer available. We pulled the audio from the from a special feature on the HD DVD that is lost in time, and we we put that in in an episode and we did a little breakdown of it which was pretty cool yeah that was really fun but uh, and that was like an interview with Cruz and jj that was just for certain deleted scenes or something like that anyway so david naylor did all these awesome features and it's just it's fun to hear him talk about stuff like that insane new york premiere where tom cruise went all around the city from place to place and all these different modes of transportation uh, he also has some uh interesting uh philip seymour hoffman stories which are great to hear um, so we'll get, I'll get into it more at the end. Okay. For now, I wanted to just uh, touch on a couple of things. Okay. <laughs> uh, actually just one thing. So something that we talked about with our making of MI3. So I thought it was re relevant here. There was a viral marketing thing that it was like a, a scavenger hunt. Do you recall this? Yeah. And like, you have to go through it all. Well, at the time when we released our making of MI3 episode, one of our listeners, Christian Evangelista reached out to us and said, I did it. I did the, the like crest scavenger hunt and, and got the thing, but he didn't have it. Now, since then, just recently, he went home and like went through some old storage stuff and he found the prize. And it's like a, a, a film cell from MI3 in this special packaging. It says like, congratulations, ultimate mission. You know, the ultimate mission global hunt is, is the thing. It's like a certificate of completion and it comes with a frame of film from, from the movie, from the from the bridge exploding scene, which is pretty cool. I, he sent us pictures. I'm gonna post it on our show notes. I just thought it was cool to bring up considering we're doing MI3 kind of bonus features things today. Cool. Well, I feel like we are failures for not having done that. Um, I know. <laughs> there were so many crazy, like, real world thing activations and stuff back then. Do you remember the crazy Dark Knight one? And you, yes. they were sending people all around town. And, I mean, well, and this was like on the early side of that. I think JJ yeah. was kind of a, an innovator with that kind of stuff, I assume, right? He was pretty good with that kind of viral marketing stuff. Yeah, he was doing stuff with Lost um, at Comic Con. And yeah. And then Cloverfield had some Cloverfield. stuff. And yeah. Oh, yeah. That whole thing. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, and this is this is even before that. This is 2006. So, Crazy. anyway, it's really cool. I'll share it in our show notes. You can take a look at those photos. Thank you to Christian Evangelista for sending that to us. And uh, that's about all I have. So, if you want to get going on the interview, I'd love to hear our uh, your shout outs, Drew. Yeah. Um, I've just got a couple of shout outs. I just want to say that this episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon and that everyone should check out his podcast, which is called My Favorite Album. Charles and myself are going to be on um, hopefully soon. I should send him a note. While he's still in lockdown, uh, we have to get get him uh, to do our episode. But he's had other guests like Drew Pierce, Rose McGowan, and Bob Odenkirk. And the concept of the show is that every week, uh, Jeremy interviews a different musician, songwriter, actor, or filmmaker about the music they love and how it's influenced them and their work. So check it out. I will say that I will just tease that my album that I'm going to be bringing to the table does have some De Palma connections and we will be discussing that on his show. And the episode is also brought to you by John B. So thank you guys so much. We couldn't do this episode without you. And without further ado, here is David Naylor's interview. David 
David, how are you doing today? I'm great, thank you. Uh, it's a lovely sunny day here in Pasadena. And uh, just uh, looking forward to this trip down memory lane. Yeah, so why don't you tell people what you did on Mission Impossible 3, what your capacity was on the production? Gosh, um, well, I, I guess I should sort of back it up to talk about my experience with working with J.J. Abrams because up to that point, I'd already done quite a few titles of his, uh, starting off with Felicity and then Alias for four years and then the first three years of Lost. And then, of course, you know, word got out that he was going to direct MI3 and being the very shy, retiring person that I am, I had the temerity to go up to him outside the office one day and ask if I could work on it. And he said to my delight that that's a great idea, you should. So next thing I know, I was in uh, Paula's office, nervous as hell, I have to say, in the Lucille Ball building on the Paramount lot, basically, you know, making sure that she was okay with me. And um, I guess she was, because then uh, I got a copy, I was asked to go to the offices and read Bob and Alex's script and uh, come up with some ideas for Paramount. Um, and obviously it was a big deal for them at the time because it was the first release they were going to do on Blu-ray, HD, DVD and SD at the same time. And at the time, the HD shooting has, was just about beginning to take off. And obviously I couldn't afford to have a full HD crew on set every day that I wanted to be there. And I love documenting as much as possible when I, whenever I work. So I purchased this prosumer Sony camera that had its own kind of recording feature at the time that was HD. And I shot a large amount of the material that you see in the bonus features myself on, you know, on set uh, or, or in, um, you know, production scouts, location scouts and so on. So I guess after coming up with some ideas for what to put in the bonus material, the first sort of real day of work for me was the camera test for the actors. Um, you know, Maggie was there and Jonathan and, and, and so on. And, and Tom walks in and, and JJ brings him over to me and says, hi. And I'm like, oh, hi. And he goes, shoot whatever you like, whenever you like. And I was like, okay. And um, so that was really the beginning. And, and from then on, I worked pretty much almost every day on set. But we started off by doing the pre-production elements, uh, such as location scouting. So I ended up going to Rome in the space of, I think, two years, about 12 times, because I was also doing the uh, special release of the HBO series Rome as well. So, you know, we did several trips to Rome, location scouting, and then we got into full, you know, production, day one of principal photography in Rome on the Tiber River. River. And it was just insane. I mean, I, you know, I'd done a lot of TV shows before. I think probably the biggest... TV show I documented was the the pilot of Lost, which was which was a big production, twelve and a half million dollars, but nothing like the scale and scope of a Tom Cruise movie, and a Tom Cruise movie which had more stunts, more action, and bigger stunts than any movie he'd done up to that point either. And um, so I got to you know Rome, and there are trucks everywhere. I mean, it's literally block upon block upon block of trucks, and the first day of shooting is when they all have just finished the explosion of the Lamborghini and they're going fast on that boat. And that's when the tune, the, the main title theme tune starts playing. And it's great. And so Tom is in the boat going full speed up and down the Tiber River with all the cast and they're all bonding. And it was great and a wonderful experience for me. And I can take you through the rest of the shooting in uh, in Italy and uh, Los Angeles and China if you want to just ask questions whenever you want but I can just keep talking about it because <laughs> it's uh, I've just rewatched everything and everything is so fresh in my mind even though it was you know so long ago did you get to look at anything from the original version of Mission Impossible 3 was there ever talk of including that amongst the sort of behind the scenes stuff there wasn't. I mean, I was aware that there had been two directors that had been attached previously and that, you know, for various reasons, they didn't end up doing it. And, you know, I know obviously that Tom wanted to try and keep this version as true to the original as possible. And, you know, Bob and Alex did such a great job with the script and they had such a great sensibility for, for you know, JJ and this sort of creative shorthand between the three of them that they'd all sort of built up over the years. 
I didn't get to see any of it. I didn't know that they, I know that they had shot some stuff. Yeah, there were at least camera tests and uh, stunt work and stuff that had been going on with Scarlett wow. and I think... Uh, yeah, it was pretty far ahead with Joe. Joe, this is the one Joe was going to do, yeah, right? Yeah, this is the one Joe, Joe was going to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, unfortunately, I, I didn't I didn't get to see any of that, which is probably a good thing, I have to say, because I, you know, I don't want to kind of have any anything going around in my mind to sort of distract me from what I was there to try and get done in terms of documenting JJ's work with Tom. And Tom really... Love JJ so much. He, he, as the story goes, and you probably know, immersed himself in uh, watching Alias. And he loved Alias. And it was a big deal for JJ to do this movie because it was his first film. And it was a huge budget. And Tom was very happy for him to do it. And, you know, you could tell by the end of that first day, if you watch the behind the scenes, everyone is just so relieved because... Things are just sort of falling into gear. And it's not one of those productions where everyone is kind of tense or anxious or on edge. Everyone just really got along. And I'm not not just sort of saying that. People were very happy to be doing it and they were really enjoying themselves. And it made my job easier, obviously, because uh, access and and so on is, is vital in what I do. And you can't get that if there's kind of issues, as you know. And But there were never issues. And I have to say, you know, big shout out to the crew as well for letting me sort of stick a camera in their face for the best part of four months, because I could never have pulled it off without that. Scott Chambliss told us that there was originally a bigger climax, and then they simplified it at a certain point during the, I don't know, some some point during the development. Did you ever see what that original climax was going to be? I think it had something to do with the cargo ships, which also then carried over into Ghost Protocol at one point. And then never got filmed? I didn't, no, no, I wish I had. And unfortunately, to my shame, I didn't look at the deleted scenes on the uh, on the DVD, which may, may have sort of tripped a few other memories. But um, the planning and pre-production and um, a thought that goes into the movies that they do is just phenomenal. I mean, the you know, these stunts were, were great, and they were very dangerous stunts. I mean, some of the months that don't look dangerous are very, very dangerous. Like the one where he's running over the rooftops in Jitang, the thousand-year-old fishing village. Those tiles have not been sort of fitted by production. They're tiles that could easily break loose and he could slip and fall. So, you know, everyone thinks when they think of that mo- of the movie, of that great stunt on the bridge where he gets thrown sideways into the car, which was so serendipitous and one of the last-minute things they did, and it's a great stunt, and obviously he did it himself, and, and they pulled it off phenomenally. But there are also so many action sequences in the film that were equally challenging and risky that people I don't think appreciate as much after watching the film. And I think the one where we all held our breath on was where the truck goes over over him in downtown L.A. And, you know, there was so little room for error on that. I think we all kind of took a deep sigh of relief once it was done. I think your footage of that is actually better than what's in the movie. Oh, well, thank you. Because you actually see all of it. It's a little tight in the finished movie and it's a little, there's a lot of cuts, but your footage is like, oh, okay. This is like one of those, will Tom Cruise get smashed by a 16 wheeler (laughs) moments, you know? (laughs) It's funny you should say, you should mention the the footage because, like I said, I, you know, there's a few shots there that I was so proud of because I hadn't really done a lot of camera work myself before. But you know, there was the one shot of the shards of fire and stuff raining down on Kerry and Tom after the explosion in the alleyway, where I'm kind of tracking the dolly as it's coming back, which I really loved. And then when we got to Calabasas, I showed JJ kind of a little sizzle reel of some of the stuff I shot, and he saw this overhead shot I had of Maggie getting out of a Lamborghini a Caserta pointing down because I I found a way up onto that roof basically and I sort of pointed the camera down as she's exiting you know getting out of the car and he goes that's a great shot I wish I thought of putting a camera there I said why don't we go back (laughs) and I think at that point they'd really spend enough money you know they didn't want to sort of do that but um yeah I was you know I was very very fortunate to get the access that I got in, in so, so many respects, because, you know, I sort of backslapping moment last night, I asked my daughter to watch it with me and she, she was kind of 
you know, trying to impress a 16 year old is a pretty daunting challenge as you can imagine <laughs> she was like you shot this and i'm like yes so so it was great so then you know we did uh we did the shoots in la which were fantastic because um you know, it was all that action at the Rycroft building, which was used in the Alias pilot. Um, it was great to see Kerry again. And of course, you know, she did so much training for that because it was completely out of her wheelhouse to be doing action. So they did this great scenes in. There's actually a shout out to Roger Guyer because I think in the movie there's an Easter egg of a, a half a frame of a shot of R2-D2 when they're looking down. As they yep. ex- yes, okay. I, yeah, yeah. I, we, you guys, you guys know this. Okay, <laughs> we love Tom, Roger. Tom Vaziri yeah. told us about that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so that was great. And then there was, of course, um, Curious George parking a uh, lot where the jump off the building was shot, and then the the stuff in downtown. But as um, going back to what I uh, mentioned to uh, Charles previously, the the big highlight for me was meeting Simon for the first time because our parent, our, our dads. We're friends at school, and my dad managed his dad's band, and um, <laughs> I didn't actually know this until after filming because I brought it up to him at the Star Trek premiere. And I said, "You're from Gloucester, aren't you?" I said, "I am too." You know, my dad knows your dad, and uh, so that was fun bonding bonding with him over that. And then I, I remember also there was a very funny prank that they pulled on JJ at the time. Monty Swan is the video playback guy. And uh, he's a very kind of slight guy, you know, he weighs probably, I don't know, about 150, 140 pounds. And they all sort of were gathered around this uh, laptop looking at this website of him winning all these bodybuilding championships, you know, like a really buff guy. And they literally had JJ probably for about five or 10 minutes. He was blown away by the fact that this really sort of frail looking guy had been a <laughs> massive, bo- and they completely faked up this website. And, and poor JJ had just been completely uh, punked or pranked or whatever it was. So was that Simon? Who, Simon engineered that whole thing or was it someone else? I don't know who engineered it. All I know was that Monty was the person who was supposedly the, the bodybuilder. <laughs> and it was hilarious. You know, Mon- Monty was such a great guy. And then, of course, you know, we were we off to China. But before that, you know, the rapper Paramount in... I was watching the interviews last night. JJ said he was very, very emotional. He actually felt like crying because they'd been going at like 100 miles an hour and, um, you know, warp speed doing all the shooting. And all of a sudden they were done at Paramount and they had to leave for for China and it it was a very emotional moment for him from you know being there and also seeing him a bit relieved to have pulled off two thirds of what they needed to do at that point and then we chartered this you know big big uh, plane for the entire crew and made our way to uh, to Shanghai which was just incredible and at that point, you know, JJ, I think, was uh, relieved, but he was also apprehensive because he was helming a very expensive movie and, and, you know, he wanted to make sure that he was doing it right and actually, you know, came up to me at one point and, and you know, said, is, uh, is everyone okay, you know, and I'm not sort of hearing any complaints or anything. And I, I said, no, everyone's very happy, JJ. You're JJ Abrams, for God's sake, you know. And he hadn't done any big movies at that point, but I think that he really wanted to make sure that his first, you know, directorial effort knocked it out of the park. And I believe, you know, well, we all saw the results. From everybody that we've talked to, these movies are notoriously difficult to shoot, obviously, given the amount of physical stunt work and uh, effects and everything else. But they've also been very difficult in, the, in terms of figuring out story, getting the script right, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we've heard so many stories about just how smoothly this third one ran. I mean, was that your experience that there, it was a pretty kind of flawless machine in actuality? Yeah. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that in, in, in a moment when we get to the launching of the, you know, the film and the premieres and so on, but it was hard work. I'm not going to say it wasn't hard work. I, I loathe doing nights at, um, you know, uh, Fontana and most of the crew stayed there because it's so far out of LA but, you know, my daughter had just been born and I, I really wanted to be at home as much as possible. So I would drive back and forth all the time, you know, barely able to stand. And at several points, you know, <laughs> Jake would come to me and say, are you OK? Are you OK? <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, that's all right. You know, you do what you have to do. 
But it was, you know, really well organized. And a big shout out to the two Tommies for that. Um, you know, even though the Italian crew had needed to get a translator for Tommy Gormley, um, <laughs> they, they certainly pulled it off. And as you can tell, they, they're experts at what they do because they ended up doing, you know, several more uh, after. Yes, we've spoken to one of the Tommies so far. The one that doesn't have a Scottish accent? Yes, correct. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> but Tommy Gormley is an absolute love. He really is fantastic. I um, I was in London doing some other piece and uh, he, he was back there. And so I interviewed him there. And of course, you know, he also uh, worked with Sheikhar Kapoor on Elizabeth. And, and I did some work with Sheikhar for a special tribute to Kate Blanchett. So, you know, Tommy is not only experienced, he is just such a pro. And he ran a, you know, he ran a tight ship. And, you know, you bring your A-game to those, to those uh, you know, uh, productions. Yeah, I think he's on the new ones right now, but we, we have to circle back with him at some point um, because, yeah, I'm sure he has some great stories. He does, he does. So anyway, we got after we got done in Shanghai, it was pretty much, you know, the rap and then uh, post-production. And I, I, what I remember about the rap was Tom took out Magic Mountain <laughs> for us. So I'm like, OK, well, this is nice. You know, we have the whole park to ourselves and I can go on every ride I want as many times as I want and not stand in line. And so so that was fun. Well, wait a, wait a, a second. Um, which ride did you go on most? Oh, gosh, I can't even remember. All I know is that I wouldn't attempt to do it now. Okay. Um, you know, it was one of the ones that was, it was probably the most violent one at the time because I know that we were, all wearing, <laughs> we were all wearing Santa hats and we all lost them because, of course, they were going flying off. And then the other sort of story I had about post-production, you've probably heard this too, was at the scoring session that Dermot Mulroney was playing the cello. Yeah. There you go. See, I, I can't tell you guys anything. I, you know, <laughs> we've heard we've heard that he, he kind of sits in whenever he can on on Michael's uh, scoring sessions. Yep. So yeah, I had not heard the thing about Six Flags though. That's awesome. So so Cruz just rented out the whole park for the whole crew. Yep, exactly. The whole crew and their families, the whole night. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It was amazing. But um, the scoring session, you know, what I, I had hoped to do, and unfortunately there really wasn't the budget or the bit space on the disc to do it, was, was actually, you know, I set up five remote cameras on the uh, sound stage, uh, you know, the scoring set stage where the orchestra were, so that you could act, we could actually cut it together, the score, to a version of the track and cut to different cameras of different parts of the orchestra. But unfortunately, we, you know, it would have been a cool feature. That's really cool. But, you know, as you know, these things are uh, best laid plans or the road to hell is paved with good intentions sometimes. But then the next big thing was the, the launch of the film because, um, and this goes back to what you're talking about, sort of, um, you know, pulling things off smoothly. And, you know, we sort of sat in a room. Oh, by the way, that reminds me, I didn't tell you the story of the dinner in, uh, in Rome, which I'll, I'll come back to in a minute, in a moment. But we had a big meeting in New York to go over the plans and the preparations for the various sites that Tom was going to go to, to pull off doing four premieres in one day. This is that whole, so this is like... It was like Mission New York or what it was called or something, right? It was all yeah. in New York City and he was going to go in all these different modes of transportation, like boat, helicopter, car or whatever. So this was all Motorbike. in one day yeah. and you yeah. were with him the whole day doing this crazy thing, right? Pretty much. I was with him at two of the locations for, for various reasons. Obviously, I couldn't go in the helicopter or the, or, or the car, but you know, I went to two of the theaters and the most memorable thing for me was... The part where he comes out of the subway, and you can see my the back of my head, which had a little more hair then, filming him and Lawrence coming up out of the subway. And, of course, it's absolute pandemonium as they exit. And they're escorted to their limo, which is basically, you know, an SUV. And Tom says, do you want to ride with, with us? And I'm like, what? You know, oh, no, of course I don't want to ride with you to the premiere of your movie. So they opened up the back of the car. And, and I laugh with Tom about this years later when we met on um, the pilot of one of JJ's films. So I'm put into the back of the SUV and Tom and Lawrence are sat right in front of me. And it's literally only a, I think, probably 400-yard drive to 
that big theatre, which was the final premiere event. And he's, you know, pointing at all these great signs and laughing and, you know, with, with uh, Lawrence. And everyone's having a great time. And then they pull up. And so it's it's crazy. They get out and everyone's screaming and screaming and screaming. And I'm like, I've got to follow them um, that no one opens my door and it's locked from the inside. <laughs> and then Tom and Lawrence begin to get on the roof of the car and start jumping up and down. So if you watch the coverage from E.T. or whatever, you'll see my face on the side of this SUV. Like, <laughs> let me out, let me out. <laughs> and... <laughs> So that was a very, very, um, very memorable thing. And then, of course, being at that premiere, there are people like Kanye there and uh, John Voight and so on. And also earlier in the day when they did the um, the premiere for De Niro's film festival, I got to meet, you know, Robert De Niro, which was a huge privilege for me. But, uh, but that was one memorable moment. And then to go back to Rome, we had a very, we were in- invited to this very intimate dinner at this uh, restaurant called uh, Antica Pesa, which is a beautiful uh, restaurant. They have one in Brooklyn as well. And uh, there were only a small handful of us there. There was, uh, you know, all the cast and uh, just basically about 15 or 20 other key people. And um, they just kept bringing one course out after another. And um, I was sat next to someone. I'm not going to say who it is. It's not anyone that you would know. It was just somebody who was, uh, you know, very key to Tom. And uh, they brought out this lamb. And uh, he said, uh, oh, I can't touch that. I don't like the lamb. I, I can't abide the lamb. And I said, well, why don't, why don't you like the lamb? And he said, well, I can't stand it. You know, they beat the poor animal over the head. And I'm like, I don't think they do it. But anyway, if you don't want it, give it to me. I'll have it. So I, I, you know, had his lamb shank or whatever. And then a little later on in the conversation, well, we were talking about Paris. And I had mentioned to him this one restaurant there that had the best foie gras I'd ever tasted. And he goes, oh, I love foie gras. And I'm I said, okay, right, I'm glad you like your foie gras. Um, anyway, I digress, I digress. Uh, um, so what else, uh, what other stories can I tell you? Gosh, well, you tell me what you want to know. I mean, I'm really kind of chattering away here. You were you were there for four months. You were in everybody's business. Was there any time that somebody told you, hey, Naylor, take a hike? There was a day when there was some dangerous stunt work being done and um, some of the things that were meant to sort of go off near the actors' heads had not sort of gone off at the right time and you know I got to set that day and I was basically told this is probably not a good day to to go up to inside the building and so and that was the only time. This was when they're doing the um, the Berlin rescue at the beginning? Okay. I mean obviously I don't you know I don't want to land anyone in it but it was and I, and I fully understood it. I mean, I don't, you know, I certainly don't want to be anywhere near where there's any tension. So I was, you know, very respectful. But that was literally the only time. Wow. You know, because if ever there was something, you know, I think that, you know, Tom and JJ trusted me to know that if there was something that I really isn't going to be any good or it's not going to sort of reflect well, I'm not going to use it. And, uh, you know, I mean... Thankfully, they, they trusted me to be sort of conscientious of that. But also, you know, the, the interesting other thing was the was meeting Sid Mead because that whole element of, of creating the mask machine, which was before 3D printers were even a thing, to get Sid to design this um, machine and, um, uh, you know, with Steve... So I managed to sort of track it from beginning to end with Steve Melton and the props guys. So that was fun. And, you know, working with Maggie is always great to um, work with her on a couple of other projects. And um, I felt so bad for her having to go from not driving to driving a Lamborghini, which is a very difficult car to drive, even if you're an experienced driver. And, you know, she talks about it. I'm not, uh, you know, no spoilers here. She talks about basically ramming it into another car at Caserta. (laughs) So uh, I felt very bad for her. But... um, she, you know, looked absolutely sensational in the movie. And Jonathan was great to work with, too. And, and the funny thing was, years later, I'm working on Hawaii Five-0, and Scott 
at uh, Khan stand in and I become friends. And I told him where I worked. He goes, oh, yeah, you know my brother Jonathan then. I said, what's your Jonathan's brother? He goes, yeah, well, I don't use that name, but he's my brother. I said, oh, okay. Well, that's <laughs> cool. So uh, it was also fun. You know, they did. this has been well documented where they tried to, they needed to get a shot at the Vatican, which, you know, is notorious for not allowing, you know, crews in. And so they hired all these very scantily clad girls to create a diversion. Right. Um, so they could get that shot off. And then, you know, shout out to uh, to all the people that let me sort of do what I did. You know, Matthew Dunn, Joey Box, Vic Armstrong, who was just unbelievable. What a nice guy. A really nice guy. And then Dawn, the script supervisor, who I worked with a lot on other shows like, you know, Lost and uh, Alias and so on. But the funny thing was, you know, it would be really quiet on set because everyone wants to, you know, Tommy wants everyone to focus on work. And all of a sudden, you would hear this outrageously loud laugh coming from Video Village because JJ had cracked a joke, which Dawn, of course, found hysterically funny. And so you, I, I can't really impersonate her laugh, but it was hilarious because the silence would be broken by this massive, you know, laughter. <laughs> and, and no one could say anything. Shut up. No, JJ, don't be funny. So uh, that was that was another memorable moment. I can't help but notice you have not brought up the dearly departed Philip Seymour Hoffman. Was he a little bit prickly uh, on set? How was his interaction with you? Uh, let's put it like uh, that. That was the, that was the hardest part. Okay. You know, I basically, day one on Caserta, I'm way in the background and uh, on a ladder, but I'm really hidden. And before I know it, dun, 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 dun. I don't want you shooting around here while I'm here. And I'm like, oh, okay. And, you know, and I didn't want to basically say, JJ, tell him to, you know, it's not my place to do that. Right. Um, and, you know, he had his own issues, obviously. Um, and I, I wasn't there to create problems for the production. And to be honest with you, there wasn't a lot of what he was doing that was going to be of any use for me. I mean, he let, he let us in on... Uh, one fight sequence, I think. And I ended up riding in a golf cart with him, which I don't think he was very happy about. But um, then... <laughs> so, uh, anyway, you know, it was sad. I mean, you know, Tom loved him. I mean, they, he had just got off of doing Truman. Yeah. So he was riding on the, the crest of that. And, and he, he, is a, he was a great, great actor. Um, and I've been in situations before where where some actors just do not like having additional cameras on set and so you know i had to respect it if it had been something that really interfered with what i was trying to create you know in terms of the content that i needed to deliver it might have been a different thing so you know i i just respected it and and dealt with it and you know so i'm sorry they left us early and left kids behind and left a great body of work but i'm sure he could have done a lot more yeah you know? yeah everybody has their own kind of <laughs> interaction with him seemingly in this movie but yeah i mean uh it sounds like you know it was a fun it was a fun time on set at the very least i mean it was it was fun seymour hoffman aside yeah yeah it, it was fun i mean buster going face down into the you know with his specialty of falling face down looked like he'd done that a few times based upon his nose too i think the only scary time for me in the entire shoot was um the uh building of that bridge in Calabasas because there was a snake wrangler on set because apparently there were so many rattlesnakes in the field that they built this bridge in. But, you know, JJ, God bless him, he, he's just such a kind-hearted, down-to-earth person. I mean, you know, there would be people coming to set like Anne Sweeney or his dad and he, or his sister, and he would always like pull me over to, to meet them. And I'm like, wow, you know, gosh, thank you. I'm so honoured. I ought to be working because I didn't really sort of want to, you know, interrupt him. But I, I can't sort of imagine on many other shoots that a director with, with that much responsibility would think to do something like that, you know? Right. Well, Charles, should I ask him the big, the big questions? Yeah, I think it's time. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe I'll start off with the hair question because... You know, I'm an expert at that. Obviously, you are an expert. You said there were. You even had a hair journey from from three to now. Obviously, you look great. Don't, you know. Thank you. Uh, but Thank what you. could you rank Tom's hairstyles through the movies? Do you have a preference, short hair to long hair? Where do you land? 
I land on my favourite being Mission 3. And it also ties into the person who didn't like lamb, by the way. <laughs> so uh, there you go. There's a hint. Um, I think. I think. Um, I think. You know. I think his hair looks great when it's shorter. You know, and it's cleaner and so on. Okay. But um, there's a little length on that one on three. Putting me on the spot there. Yeah. Okay. So you're not a two or four guy. You don't like the flowing locks. No, I'm not really down to that. I'm really more into the kind of you know paramilitary type of uh yeah you know don't mess with me kind of thing charles and i have found a lot of people don't like the short hair so you are oh, really? in rarefied company yeah. but we love it interesting in particular a lot of people don't are not taken with the it seems like people are not taken with the first movie's hair we have found some people who are but it's it's very sad to us because we love the hair in the first one I think it's great, yeah. The hair in the first one is good. I just didn't like, you know, the John Woo one and uh, the other one that was kind of a little too, you know, too much right. for me. You a, know. Little, a little too beautiful? Yeah, a little too beautiful. <laughs> You're meant to be a rugged, you know, secret agent here or whatever. I doubt whether there's going to be much difference in the hair between seven and eight, I guess. No, it looks, <laughs> it looks pretty close to three, actually. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah. It looks good. <laughs> And so this is a huge undertaking to be doing two movies at once, but I guess that's a great way of not, you know, aging your leading actor. Well, and also not yeah. having to for him to kind of decompress and then have to build back up to fighting shape, right? Yeah, training yeah. wise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and he worked. He works so damn hard. You know, people don't believe the amount of work that he does, and it's just phenomenal. I mean, the guy doesn't sleep. He's so focused, and it was such a learning experience. You know, for me to come away from being at that level, experiencing that. I mean, I, you know, in the Rome premiere, I'm just hanging out with his kids, watching his kids, you know, and all these thousands of people are out there. And, you know, the trust that he and JJ put in me, when I look back on it, it's just phenomenal. You know, it's so lucky. Well, here's the big question. Can you rank the movies? You can do it either from, from best to worst. We like the rank of it as the most excellent to the least excellent. I, well, I, this is a very political question, just it, so you it know. It is, I know, but you're, um, you're, you've kind of, you've left that, that world a little bit. You have some, some <laughs> hindsight. You can really... Yeah, I'm doing carpentry now. Right, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, the Mission Impossible world. You, you, you know, you're not, you're not as emotionally invested in number three, so don't let that interfere. Well, I'll tell you my top three. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I think three and four are great. I mean, you know, Brad was phenomenal. JJ, obviously, not just because I was there. I think it's a great film. I think, uh, you know, I, I rewatched Fallout last night, too. And I think Fallout's great, too. I, I really, you know, I think Christopher was probably still finding his feet on Rogue Nation. You know, I think it really, you know, it's an ambitious way to get going. But um, he certainly hit his stride with, with Fallout. The script was solid, the characters were solid, the pacing was great, the scenarios were, were wonderful, all the little kind of twists with Simon. Obviously, two had its issues. I, I like it, it's great. And one is great too, but I think my top three would be uh, three, four, and six. Wow. Okay. Is that diplomatic enough? I think it's great. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> and I think that Macquarie has said in the past that Rogue Nation kind of is just drifting off of Ghost Protocol a little bit. So I think that he would actually agree with you in that scenario as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it, look, it's a creative endeavor and you never like to, I'm not trashing his work by any means. Obviously, they all work their damn butts off on that. And and uh, it, it stands as a good film. But, you know, if you want to kind of rank it in, in terms of the others, I don't think it's up there with, with Ghost Protocol and um, Fallout. I think Brad did a phenomenal job. I was very surprised when I heard that he was going to be directing, it, but I really loved Ghost Protocol. I thought it was a fantastic film. Yeah. Well, David, thank you so much for accepting this mission. This was a huge thrill, and we love to get this amazing kind of perspective on the whole production that we wouldn't normally get. So, Well, you know, it's been a thrill for me too, so it's been an honor. Thanks so much, guys. We're back. Charles, come on, hit me. Hit me with your notes. (laughs) 
Well, I love. Uh, obviously, we need to we need to get Tommy Gormley on the show. We talked about Tommy Gormley in this interview, and we just need to get him. It's he's such an important figure since MI three for all the movies. Yes, um, he's been on our list, the top of our list, near the top, maybe, for many many months, probably for a while, maybe years. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I think he. We saw on IMDb that he is working on the new ones, right? Yes, he's a producer on the new ones. Okay. I don't know if he's still AD for the new one because there was another AD listed at one point on, I think, on McCory's Instagram. So we'll have to get clarification on that. But he's working on the movie. He's worked on all of them since three. He was the first AD. And just as a tease to everybody out there, we did get the first AD for one of the first two movies. And we talked to him recently. Wow, what a tease, (laughs) Jaros. So we are going to have him on the show soon. We've got a lot of great episodes coming up. And we got the Tommy Gormley of Mission Impossible 1. I'll just say it. It was Chris Soldo, who has also recently appeared on the Bonfire of the Vanities podcast the Turner Classic Movies has been doing, which I always forget the the actual name of the podcast. It's called The Plot Thickens, and it's season two, The Devil's Candy. Oh, thank Wow, you just had that ready to go. Okay, well, yeah. anyway, we were very excited to talk to Chris Soldo. He was a great interview. We've got him coming up. So he's the Tommy Gormley of Mission Impossible 1, and so it was very cool to talk to him. And hopefully we'll get Tommy Gormley after MI7. But anyway, back to David Naylor's interview. I loved uh, hearing about how Tom Cruise rented out six flags for the whole crew around Christmas time. Oh, my God. What a dream. That yeah. is so cool. That just would be so awesome. I mean, how does that happen? I mean, does Six Flags have days that are just blocked off for something like that? Or do I think they probably closed it early. I'm sure it was like, you know, between nine and two or something, you know. Oh, okay. So it's like after hours in the park, probably. Yeah. Here's my question. You think Cruz rode the rides or at that point was was the, you know, somewhat mundane thrill of roller coasters <laughs> sort of <laughs> Too too weak for him, you know? Well, in MI3, I feel like the, the thrills were not quite at the same level as they are now. Like, I feel like post-Halo Jump, post, uh, you know, Burj Khalifa, post-A400, now theme parks for him are nothing. But maybe back in 06, theme parks were still uh, still cool for him? I mean, he, he jumped off a building and almost got run over by a truck. So maybe the maybe the stuff was st- <laughs> are starting to pump through him, you know? But... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I bet I bet he loves roller coasters. I bet so. I bet so too. And I bet he's really <laughs> appreciative when he gets off the roller coaster and thanks the, <laughs> the ride operators like, "Oh man, that was great, guys." Yeah. That's what I think. It was also hilarious uh that Philip Seymour Hoffman was not happy about riding in a golf cart with David Naylor. <laughs> I love that story. Um, the awkward golf cart ride with Philip Seymour Hoffman. Just, you know, always always love a good Philip Seymour Hoffman story. He was just the, the fucking greatest. And, of course, we're sad that he is gone. But uh, it's always always some good Philip Seymour Hoffman stories. Love him. Yeah. My favorite thing about the Philip Seymour Hoffman stories we've gotten to are, like, he's either an Olympic athlete or could barely sort of function physically. Right. And where where the truth lies, I'm sure, is somewhere in between. But um, it's just really fascinating. <laughs> but also, everybody talks about how he was just the fucking greatest actor. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, we, we watched Magnolia recently, somewhat spurred on by the multiple Magnolia references in Ted Lasso. And, uh, man, his performance is just unbelievable unbelievable yeah. but anyway yeah we miss him we miss him a lot but what else what else you got charles that's all that's all i've got i mean i guess oh. i've got to thank some people i've got to thank yeah. uh sonia miranda a uh, very special thank you to sonia and to frederick skaug fatness which I, I hope i've pronounced your name right frederick i'm sorry if i butchered it thank you so much to sonia and frederick for making this episode possible and also uh want to credit our editor and mixer luke burson and our intern parth marate and of course our music by kevin blumenfeld as always we encourage paramount to reach out to kevin and sue him uh when you have time but uh yeah that's i think that's all i got i just of course encourage people to sign up for our patreon patreon.com slash light the fuse 
please sign up at the bonus content level. You'll get so many fun episodes we've done. So many fun things. We're about to record one about uh, you know what we love about the Lethal Weapon movies. Uh, Richard Donner obviously just passed away, so we've done we did a tribute to him as well, and we've done episodes about Brian De Palma, our favorite De Palma movies. We've done episodes about The Fast and the Furious. We did episodes about uh, we did what Pixar, our Pixar. top Pixar movies. We did the best movies of the year so far. Um, we just talk about all kinds of stuff, and of course, we keep up with all the Mission Impossible Seven news as well. So please sign up. It supports the show. Another way to support the show is to buy a shirt or a mask or a tote bag or laptop case or whatever from TeePublic, which is linked from our website, lightdiffusepodcast.com. In our merch section, you can find that there. You can also head on over to the episode guide and check out all the awesome show notes for every episode because they are a great visual companion to every episode that we have here that you listen to that is so soothing to your ears. Our shrill voices. Uh, so uh, that's about all I've got, I think. Drew, anything else? Just that people should like, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening to this. And uh, yeah, I mean, I really can't encourage people to uh, join the Patreon enough because I think it's a really fun community that we've established. If you get into the higher levels, you get these great um, monthly Skype chats that we do. And we, uh, you know, we've got a lot of great ideas for when um, things start ramp- ramping up for Top Gun Maverick as well as Mission Impossible 7 and 8. So yeah, that's it. I think. Yeah, stay tuned. We've got some awesome episodes coming up. We're really excited about some of the guests we've got coming up and also uh, working on a making of Rogue Nation, which is going to be really cool. We, we love our making of episodes. They're a lot of fun as well. I know. I feel like as soon as we finish them, though, we talk to someone who blows open the whole movie and then we should, you know, redo it. We should really be doing these like once a year. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> incorporating all the stuff that we've learned. But yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's it. Um, we'll be back next week. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod, and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.